I know we're back. Everybody's outside networking. We didn't want to be rude, but, you know, it's a whole other rest of the program here. Um, how are we feeling? It's been a while since I saw you all. So how was lunch? Fabulous. Yes. How was the breakouts after lunch? Awesome. We're good. We're feeling good. All right. So we're going to continue to move on with our day. Um, we have some more panelists that are going to bless you with some gems. But um, before we get into that, um, I need to make the announcement that we actually have um, Stride Consulting in the building today. Um, so Emmanuel is actually here. That's him right there waving in the back. The man with the hat on. It's not a lot of men here, so it should not be hard to find him. Um, so uh, make sure that before you leave, uh, you connect with him. And um, I don't know. I don't know if you might be looking for a job. I don't know what it is, what you're looking for. But ask a question, and maybe you might get an answer that you like. Um, so just wanted to thank uh, uh, Stride for being here with us. And without further ado, I'm going to bring up the next panel. And this one is about cultivating success. So if you guys noticed, all the main stage moments that we had throughout the day, it's all kind of getting bigger and bigger and just kind of segueing into how you can truly be successful. Um, so before I bring out um, all the panelists, I'll have Victoria, where's she at? Come on up, our moderator, and I'll give it up for her and the rest of the ladies that you're about to hear from today. Hey, hey, everybody. Y'all ready? Come on, you know, Woo! exactly, I feel like the hype man. All right, so um, please excuse me if I say people's uh, names incorrectly. <laughs> Definitely come up here, take like a mic and correct me. So uh, first up, we'll have Toby Basside. I'm probably saying your name close, okay. Yes, yes, girl, JP Morgan, managing director. Next. Actually, I work at Capital One, I'm a principal engineer. Oh, it says, you look, I'm just reading what they got up there. They wrong. <laughs> Capital One, y'all. All right. So next, Bria Sullivan, software engineer at Google. We're at Google today, guys. Clap a little, you know, clap, clap like y'all care. Woo! So uh, we have next up, uh, Miss Lindsay Red, infrastructure engineer at Lyft. And um, hopefully, I, you know, I was in point, I don't know if this person was pointed out to me. Oshel Drysdell, Woo! software engineer at Glo Goldman Sachs. Yes. So this is our lovely panel. Could you give them all a round of applause? Yes. OK, so I mean, I wrote my questions down on a piece of paper. And I'm, I'm going to go a little bit off. But I think when you start a panel, you kind of need to introduce who's on the panel and I think the best people to introduce the person is themselves so could you just tell me really quickly a little bit about you and how you started in tech really quick because you know we on a time crunch okay I'll go first um I'm Toby like as mentioned um I started out actually doing uh some basic data analysis at a health IT company um, and kind of moved into um, using things like SQL um, just because my background is in applied mathematics. And uh, once I started like getting into some of that kind of basic coding, um, it sort of just unfolded in terms of like using things like Python for um, like pandas and Python for data analysis. And, you know, as I started learning different things, I had had some exposure to R in college um, that just kind of kept unfolding. And so um, got into software engineering that way. Hi, I'm Bria. I'm a software engineer here at Google. Um, and I'm also the founder of TechStacked. It's an online community for um, developers and startup founders who want to grow their careers and um, companies together. Um, and I got into tech by accident, kind of, or uh, I just, um, when I was applying to college, I wanted to make money and um, it was in the middle of the recession. And I was like, okay, I don't want to be broke after college and I don't want to get a mass, I don't want to do graduate school. So I just like uh, Googled um, top paying salaries out of college. And <laughs> Smart. <laughs> you smart. <laughs> yeah. And um, and I was really good at like calculus and physics. So I was like, okay. I just went down a list and it was like, boring, boring, boom. And then I was like, okay, cool. And then I learned once I got there to college. 
Hi, I'm Lindsay Red. Um, I work on infrastructure at Lyft. Um, I'm on like the DevOps -y kind of team, so I build out our um, Kubernetes based development environment. Um, so I knew I wanted to be an engineer uh, when I went to college, but I didn't know what kind. I started doing like mechanical engineering, and I it was not fun for me. <laughs> but uh, taking my first computer science class was really empowering because you just write code and you see it happen and um, it translated or like the transition from college to working in a tech company seemed more straightforward to me. Um, I could tell what I would be doing later um, and so yeah I really liked it. thought it was fun um, and did a program called Code 2040 which helped me get my first internship at Lyft and I work there full time. Cool. Wait. Oh sure. <laughs> Hi, my name is Ochelle Drysdale. Um, I actually have a degree in uh, computer engineering from New York University Polytechnic. Um, thanks, X. <laughs> um, I uh, joined Goldman after doing two internships at other companies. I was at GE and um, an insurance company. Um, and I rose in the ranks. I started in software development as a C++ developer, working on our low latency trading stack for equity trading. Um, I found that to be boring. Um, <laughs> and I had to, it took me a while, but I did uh, pitch to switch, reskill myself, and now I run um, the day-to-day -day SRE function for our for Goldman Sachs futures execution business out of New York. So I'm one of three leads um, from New York, London, and Asia, and the three of us, we kind of come together and think of the strategy for our global SRE function for futures. All right, see, they're super talented, right? <laughs> All right, so first question, and we gotta keep it real quick. How do you build alliances in and outside of your office? How do you build alliances? How do you connect? You I'll know? take that one um, or comment, I guess, a little bit. Um, so I'm in machine learning, to be particular, um, at Capital One, uh, not J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, <laughs> and I used to work there, though, but not anymore. And um, I think the most important thing in terms of building alliances is um, just really understanding, like, teammates, like, who's influential, you know, who your stakeholders are, and sort of you know, creating that mental map of um, kind of like, you know, who your committee or who, you know, like who you need to, you know, have bought in to. Because, I mean, on, on one hand, it's like you're, you're involved with the company mission and you're supposed to be sort of like, um, you know, pushing the company mission forward, whatever project you have. But on the other hand, like you're an individual and you're like trying to cl climb a ladder, right? So you need to make sure that your mission as an individual aligns with the company mission. And so in order to do that, you sort of need like maybe a round table in a sense. And, you know, who's, who's in that round table in terms of like who can advocate for you? Um, and so, you know, obviously you need to actually accomplish the project goals. And so it's like, is it the business stakeholders, is it your manager, your teammates? Like, who are those people and how do they sort of operate? So I'm really understanding and studying people, their personalities um, is really important in terms of like sort of customizing your style, customizing um, your interaction with them in such a way that you understand what's important to that person, what's important to you know the people you need in your corner. And essentially, once you know what they want, then you can see like, hey, can I either directly give you what you want or figure out how to introduce you to someone who can or, you know, figure out some way to get you to what you want. And once you have that, once you're sort of like exchanging that, you know, or offering that sort of token of, you know, that gift, then I think automatically people, you know, build alliances with you. Anybody else real quick? Um, I guess from like a new a new starting perspective, I'm not new, but I just have like been on a lot of teams, um, and I actually just transferred to this office. I was in the LA office. Um, one thing that I've learned is that like um, I was very shy, 
And I didn't really like, I just kind of like stayed in my lane, but I, that was kind of like getting in my own way. Um, and one thing that has really helped is like right when you start, just make a like make a coffee meeting or something with every single person on the team, every stakeholder on the team, and then just like keep it up, like even if you can have a cadence. Um, and then I got some advice from this woman about like raising money and like maintaining relationships. She said to like even keep a spreadsheet. I'm just a spreadsheet type of person. I don't know if you are, but like even just to rem remember certain things about people so that when you're going to like, uh, cause I think sometimes if you have like a better personal connection, um, it'll be easier to um, like work together because like, we probably have all dealt with, you know, problem people in the workplace. It just makes it a little bit easier. Um, and then I would say outside of work, if, if you guys aren't on Twitter or like active on Twitter or LinkedIn, um, it's like such a useful tool for networking um, and building alliances outside of the company. Um, there are like, there's tons of people in tech and like I've witnessed personally, like probably a few times a week, people get jobs on, because of interactions on Twitter, like there are CEOs of like big companies just like at your fingertips and usually they'll respond or they might even just be like, okay, well, I'll help this person. So um, there's like so many ways to cultivate um, using technology. So I would just really stress doing that. All right. Um, oh. I'll, I'll also add one bit. Um, so the, the points or the gems I'll say were on the what to do um, the exchanging portion, but I always believe that the prerequisite to that is knowing who you are and what you can offer. Um, a lot of the times um, you'll walk into a room and you network and we feel the pressure to want to um, change ourselves to what we believe the need is. And I mean, to a certain extent that is called being agile, but there are certain core values, core skills that you possess and what makes you unique that you also need to let shine through outside of that agility, that, uh, that ability to um, mold to the environment and build alliances. People will be drawn to someone who has a sense of self, a great sense of self. And if you're not, you know, if we vibe, we vibe, that's fine. If we don't vibe, that's okay too. Right. Because if we don't vibe, you were never meant to be an alliance. And we need to understand that just because that person's powerful and they don't they don't like me. It doesn't mean that my career now is stagnant. It means that I'm just waiting now for that next that powerful person who does and is attracted to my core skills. Can, it feels like they can um, help grow those skills f to build an alliance with me. You know, it's not just about quantity at that point. It's really more about quality after after a certain point. Okay. Okay. Y'all learning something? Y'all got y'all got you got something? Okay. How do you find mentors and also how do you find sponsors? I can start. Um uh Shout out to Code 2040. I don't know if y'all know about this program, but it helped me find a lot of mentors and a lot of sponsors. Um, so becoming a part of something where the goal is to help people grow their careers is really helpful. Because people are looking for mentees um, and, and you can find a lot of people who will make themselves available for you. Um, I'd say from a technical standpoint, I've like been working for like almost exactly one year. Um, and so I've needed a lot of help at my job. Um, and one thing that I found that's been really helpful is getting on projects with people who I admire, um, getting on projects with people who are really senior to me um, and making it clear to them that one of the reasons I wanna work with them is so that they can help me grow. Um, and then they'll make it clear to you whether that's something they feel like they can do or not. Um, but I have found that those people also can become my sponsors when I'm, you know, trying to get really good reviews for my performance reviews, or I'm about to go up for promotion. So, um, these are the people that I'm banking on: people who have seen me grow, people who know the kind of work that I can produce, uh, because I because they've seen it firsthand um, to vouch for me when I'm when I'm trying to go up for these next big opportunities. I'll just add a couple notes. Um, so, firstly, I want to differentiate. Uh, between mentorship and sponsorship because they're often kind of like um, conflated with one another. So um, mentorship is more along the lines of you need to learn something, maybe some particular skill set or, you know, particular job um, 
you know, skill to do your job, job, job function. Um, and then sponsorship um, is, you know, someone advocating for you, someone who is, you know, at those meetings that you can't be present for um, and who is championing you. Um, and, you know, maybe, maybe potentially even removing barriers, right, to your success um, that you can't remove for yourself. So typically very senior, that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of how to kind of gain mentors, gain sponsors, what I've, what's worked for me in my career is with regards to mentorship, I found that to be very easy. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, do I see someone who knows something that I want to learn and then just, you know, asking them questions that typically has been very easy. Um, it depends on like, I guess, company culture, but um, most companies I've worked for are pretty open. Um, and so it's usually easy to find at least one person in, you know, t a typical company that, that knows something well and is willing to answer your questions. So as long as you have specific questions, I think that finding a mentor is pretty easy. Sponsorship has been tougher for me. Um, I think connecting on some level in terms of like, um, you know, similarity, maybe you both went to the same school or maybe you both have a similar heritage, um, whatever it is, you both like some sport. Um, I think that's a really great way, but even more importantly than that, um, in terms of sort of like you going to them, there is actually a way that sponsors can come to you. And so things like public speaking, um, just doing really well at your job and killing it. So like, uh, for example, I spoke in PyCon um, and that was something that my company sponsored and um, they got a lot of positive feedback from me speaking at this conference. It was like an hour and a half talk that I gave on an aspect of machine learning. And so, you know, doing something that gives you that kind of broad exposure can actually attract sponsors to you because they see that the value, they see the value you're generating for the company. Um, <clears throat> so those are sort of, I guess, some ways that I've kind of approached um, mentorship and, and sponsorship in my career. I think also to, to add to it, even though I'm not officially on the panel, <clears throat> I, I for me, it's really been difficult to find a mentor, especially when I was like first starting my company and I wanted to find a mentor. I think the resources, there are also like resources out there to find mentors on platforms. There are tons of groups. People are probably in groups now and on Facebook, on Slack, on Meetup. So definitely those places are great. Or if you're an accelerator, I think those are some options. Um, some foundations provide mentorship too. So I think you can always look, like really doing some research. I think research solves a lot of problems. Um, so just doing the research, you might be able to find a mentor. I haven't found a great mentor yet, but um, I've been connected to some mentors and I've definitely um, tried to play the role to be a mentor to others as well. Um, next question. What do you think was the biggest factor that contributed to you climbing the ladder of success? The biggest factor. Um, I will say, um, this is something that you're not really supposed to say, but I think that luck plays a lot of, um, it plays a lot into like what has happened to, for me to be successful. Um, luck includes, you know, like right place, right time, um, you know, like being born in, you know, like privilege and all those things. Um, and, but from that luck, I was able to like, so I was basically at a job that I was not doing well and there was all these other things going wrong in my life and there was just like no way to feel successful from that. And then um, when I got to Google, first I had my best friend already worked here. I had her to like help me. Um, and then I was placed on a team that my manager was like, I need to make sure that she's completely supported. I need to make sure there's a senior black woman on the team that she can look up to. I need to make sure that she can like, basically he made, he made sure that I was successful and I didn't even ask for that. And it was from that that I was like, I learned so much from be, from people being brought into my life that um, now when making decisions moving forward, I know what to ask for and I know what my intentions are. So like I just switched teams, I needed to make sure that my top five things, I was able to figure those out from that. And now it's just like, I'm asking you, you have to give me these five things or I will not join your team. And that's the same thing for like joining startups, 
of like even being friends with people. So, and I will also say that like sometimes it feels like um, success is almost like an avalanche. And when you're like always constantly fighting, it's so hard to feel um, like successful. But then once you feel a little bit, it's like, okay, you have some room that you can kind of like take more. That's all I'll say. Um, I'll say that um, mentorship has definitely played a, a very pivotal role in my climb. Um, I actually, when I started at Goldman, X was my mentor. <laughs> she was a senior black woman in, in our business unit, and I, may, I immediately gravitated to her. I was like, in this sea of white. <laughs> Where? <laughs> Where? <laughs> oh! And um, she took me under her wing and, you know, I, I don't believe that, I mean, some mentors you have throughout your whole career and there's some mentors you have for a season and she was my mentor and then she became my friend. You know, you are my friend. Aww. Anyway, um, so, uh, but, it, you know, in the, in the course of the early part of my career, I, I made, um, I, I had a lot of mentors that I was able to really make a sounding board. I kind of whined to them and I kind of asked them questions and they directed me technically and also mentally, emotionally, how to deal with this, navigate, you know, this, um, this culture. Um, and as I rose up in the ranks or I guess gained more um, experience, when it came time to really think about where I wanted to go next, it was actually a mentor that hired me for a role, a new role. And, and that seat that I sit in, I didn't, I actually got hired in as part of the SRE function, but then he left that role. And after all that, he would be, he was able to then really mentor me and groom me and navigate me into the role I am now leading the function that I was hired into. So um, I think, a combination of what I call timing, because I don't really believe in luck, but timing, really, and um, and good mentors, mentors who are um, looking out for you, and and when they can advocate for you, they are advocating for you. That has really been or made the, the biggest difference in my career. And. Uh just one note to piggyback off something Bria said earlier with regards to things that she's asking for up front, um, you know, joining a team, et cetera. For me, intentionality has been really important in terms of the that's the single most important thing in terms of, you know, the success I've had in my career is being strategic. So why am I getting this degree? Why am I, you know, taking this job? Um, what jobs am I looking for? Are they going to get me to my long-term goal, um, my vision for myself? Um, so kind of just having that overall picture. I'm a very visual person. And so um, I kind of see sort of like my end goal. And there are sort of like various steps in between. Obviously, you know, if you're, you, you can't just like climb the mountain or sort of like get over that avalanche, right? You have to kind of like bit by bit understand what steps are needed. So if it's a matter of doing research, right? So like making sure, like she said earlier, again, Bria, um, you know, which jobs are the highest paying, right? You know, what do I need to do there to get there? Um, or just what do I like, right? Like, what do I find a lot of joy and passion from doing? Um, and, you know, is this degree, say if it's a degree or is this job um, going to facilitate that? Because um, you, you want a job that makes you feel fulfilled, right? You don't wanna just feel like you're getting a paycheck. Um, so those are some particularly important things when you're interviewing, right? Like asking the right questions, making sure if you can have someone inside internal in the company tell you like the unfiltered real deal with regards to like how that company actually operates, how that team actually operates. And once again, you know, will you have the resources to succeed? Will you, you know, actually be like, let's say you want a promotion in six months or you want some kind of like revisiting of your salary or whatever it is. Um, I think I'm getting into the next question, but you know, you get the idea, right? Like you have a goal, stick to that goal. And, and I've always been unwavering in the sense of that. I'm not going to sort of feel like, okay, well, it's been maybe six months I've been searching. And so let me just take whatever, right? Like really believe in yourself, believe in that vision for your, for your long-term career and stick to it. 
um, consistency is very important in terms of, uh, you know, real long-term success. Um, do I have time for one more question or are we going to do Q&A now? Okay. Okay, cool. So I can ask this, this, I think, last question and then we have to do Q&A. How would you suggest someone ask for recognition or raise? If not, what would you have done differently? Um, I'm like about to be in this process of going after a promotion. And I think um, one really good piece of advice that I got um, when I was an intern probably was to write everything you do down. Um, I mean, as black women, I feel like it's, people feel like they can take credit for our work. People feel like, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, people will run all over you if you let them. Um, a lot of times we're not visible. Um, and I think one thing that people can't deny is numbers and a paper trail. And so like, if I've done something or worked on a project, I will ask my manager if I can send an email to the company about it or like um, record numbers uh, from uh, results that you've delivered um, and write those things down on your performance reviews um, so that when it comes time for someone to evaluate uh, whether you deserve a promotion or a raise or not, it doesn't come down to weird biases that people have and like weird perceptions of what they think you can do. It's like right in front of them what you have actually done. Um, and so, you know, fingers crossed, hope that, that works. But um, uh, I think that was really good advice that I got. So I have to I have to cut off the questions for me so I can definitely allow you guys to ask questions. So anyone have any questions out there? Come up. Come on, the price is right. Come on down. Hi, well, this light is bright. Um, Say hi. who you are. I'm Jolene. Um, so we're talking about su success. So I wanted to flip the question. How have you used failure to help you create success? Um, yeah. Child, all of us have failed. Come on now. <laughs> I did. <laughs> if I were to look at things negatively, all I did was fail. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, what I, I mean, I'm sorry if I jumped on this question because I know we all have different um, perspectives on this. Um, I think failure is critical because if you don't, un, if you aren't able to experience failure, you'll never really appreciate success. And that's probably something that you've heard in many different ways throughout your life. Um, I had to experience incredible failures, at least, you know, in retrospect, they weren't that bad, but I felt um, like bottom of the barrel, like I should have should have done better. And you go through this process of beating up on beating up on yourself and saying no one else here is doing or as bad as this as me. But as you incur more failures, you realize that this is just my path to success, right? Because all you really need is one success to really motivate you to the next success. Because the path to success is really paved with what? Failure. Failure, right? You just need one success, and you just need that as a launching point to project you to your next success. Um, and particularly for me, um, the young lady at JPMC, GPMC that said um, she suffered from imposter syndrome, um, I think that that is so, like... It's, 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 it's just inevitable, right? Those are all, that's all failure manifesting itself in, the, in, the, in different ways. And in a lot of ways, you'll look at yourself and you say, you know, I'm, I'm my biggest, I'm my worst enemy in this. Because everyone fails, but it's how you handle the failure that really dictates how you get up, how you recover, and how you move on. Because if you decide, and this is, this is me talking from experience, I've had failures where it took me years in my career to really recover from them. And then when I look back, I'm like, why was I sitting in that for so long, right? I was more than that, right? But if I had recovered, but as I, and there were failures after that, but I learned to recover. You learn to bounce back, right? And, and, and if anything, failure has, has taught me resiliency. It has taught me who I am and only reinforced who I am. So if, if I fail at something, well, I know I'm not that, you know, this is what I do well. 
right? All it does is it it sharpens who I am and re and 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 just re solidifies who I am as a person. And and when you and then go back to my original point when I was making, when you know who you are, this world can't tell you anything, right? You get what I'm saying? Because even down to you know social media where you tell black women you know you're black girl magic you're a black queen but how do I translate that to my day to day I can't go into my MD's office and say I'm a black queen <laughs> give me more money you know how do I translate that you know I it, the failures that I encounter have helped me translate I'm a black queen to, I may not have the vision, but I can take your vision and surpass it to where you need it to be. That's what I can do. I'm talking as me, as Oshelle Drysdale, that's what I do. I'm a gifted executioner. I, I don't have to have the vision to have the passion to take it out. I may not need to be in the room making decisions, but I need to be in the room implementing and leading the, 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 the how. And, and you'll need someone like me to push it through and pass the, fish, the finish line. That's what I bring to the table. And, and I'm not an entrepreneur. But I know that I can take an entrepreneur to the next level. I can take the CEO to the next level. It's fine. I'm not an entrepreneur. But I know that the skills I have are valuable to every table I sit at. And that's what failure has taught me. That's dope. Everybody. You know? To the left, to the left. We got a question to the left. Um, hi. Uh, I have a question for Toby, I believe. Um, so you mentioned something about um, I think the last sentence you said was sometimes like stay in consistent and like don't waver. Like, for, and you gave the example of like if you're looking for your first job, <laughs> and it just so happens that I'm looking for my first job the past six months, and I'm like, when do you know when to pivot? Like, when do you know when to take that risk that this is the time to move on or this is the time to um, take a maybe a, a job that's not so much what you want? You know how people try to sell you, oh, it's your first job, you want to get your foot in the door and something like that. Um, so. How, when have you ever had to pivot? When have you ever had to take a risk, just move? Like, just wait. Yeah. So kind of jumping off the failure, I failed so many times, it's not even funny. <laughs> it's all just like, you know, trying to get back on. And so like some examples are for, like even in my, in terms of my first job um, out of college, um, that wasn't necessarily my dream job. So I guess maybe to maybe add some more context to my comment about being unwavering, um, I'm not saying like, you know, the only job you should take is like whatever your end goal is. Like, you know, let's say my end goal is to be CEO of a major company. Like, I'm not going to be like, oh, yeah, like I'm just going to like wait around until someone gives me the CEO of X company. Um, that's, that's not exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying that you need to be strategic and intentional in making sure whatever job you take is a stepping stone towards whatever your greater purpose is or the vision you have for your sort of life is. And so, um, I'm not quite sure what you are trying to do long-term in terms of like your career aspirations, but in my first job, I was just sort of looking to build off of like my my undergrad, which was in mathematics. And so I was interested in basic data analysis and I happened to found that, find that at um, a IT company. I, w I was also pre-med, so I was interested in like staying in the healthcare route or realm, I should say. And so the, the IT company was a health IT company and we, we were building electronic health record software. Um, I wasn't an engineer at that time. I was doing a mixture of project management and data analysis, but um, it was something that I felt was, you know, somewhere where I could learn. It was somewhere where, um, you know, I liked the people. Um, I felt appreciated. Uh, it aligned with my values. Um, so, you know, it, I kind of ended up maybe accidentally getting into technology in the sense that the data analysis I was doing was for a software development team. And so, um, you know, got exposure that way. Um, but that's sort of like the kind of thing I'm saying is like, I didn't know exactly what 
like my sort of uh, future held in terms of like my first job from undergrad. But I did know that I was interested in healthcare. I was interested in sticking with numbers. And so, you know, it wasn't like the best job ever. Like I wasn't getting paid a ton. I wasn't even like a full-time employee. I was just a part-time employee. But, um, you know, there were things that I learned in that job that were able to sort of like launch me and catapult me to you know, one of my later jobs where I was a full-time employee, where I was, you know, making better money, et cetera. Does that help? Yeah, it does. Thank okay, you. great. Question on the, the right. This is the last question. Sorry, guys. Hi, hello, everyone. My name is Candice, and I'm really curious, especially when you first started out, when did you feel very confident in what you're doing? Um, kind of piggybacking off of when Bria said, like, if you don't give me those five things, I'm not going on your team. So when did the light bulb switch happen that you became very confident? And if you were confident from the gate, from the get-go, what did you pull that source from to carry that with you when you're moving in and out of these rooms? Um, so... I'm like a year and three months and I'm still, I still ask myself that question all the time. I'm like, when, when, when are things going to click? And I think if you're putting yourself, yourself in situations where you're really learning and growing a lot, it's always going to feel a little bit uncomfortable. Um, one thing my first manager told me was it'll take you a year to learn how to do this job. And at the time I was like, um, excuse me, like that's a long time. <laughs> um, but it's true. But I think you get more comfortable or I, for me anyway, I've gotten more comfortable with being uncomfortable and like knowing that that just means I'm growing and I'm learning a lot. Um, and I, I would be a little wary if I were in a position where like I'm fully, I have it figured out. Um, yeah. I don't know. Um, I'll just say that I didn't feel confident at all until my first promotion. Um, that was, like, the first time, like, to be honest, that I just felt validated um, because, like, I guess at Google they have, like, peer reviews and stuff. And um, I – and also talking to other people and working with other people, it was, like, I was always working with people way more senior than me, and I just always felt like I don't know enough. And when I started, there was this guy who started maybe three months before me, and he was just a rock star. So I just felt like I was always keeping up with him. And no matter what, I was just always trying to keep up with him that I wasn't even, like, seeing where I was. And then, like, all of a sudden, I, like, every single um, performance review, I got, like, a way higher calibration than I thought I was. And I was just like, I, every single time it's like, am I getting fired? Like I really go <laughs> every single one. I'm just like, I wonder if, I, if this is a time where they say you're not doing good, get out of here. Um, but, and then it was just like every time it felt better. And then as I started to work with other people and see how they work, um, my perception from the outside was always these people were really great. Then once you start to get better at your skills, you're like, oh, I can do exactly, like I can learn from what they did and also apply like what I would do. Um, and I actually feel like I can take, I feel confident that I can take anything that you give me. Um, but then it's also when um, I was on a team that, or on a project where I was just like, I don't think I can be successful here. And that was like a humbling. And I had to tell my manager, I will not be successful on this team. I don't know what I'm doing. And after trying so hard and then once going on to a different, on a different project and I like did well, it's just really knowing what you're actually capable of. Um, and then like, again, switch team so I could come here. And I was just like, okay, I looked at their entire stack beforehand and I needed to know, is this something that I can do? And I've been on the team for a little bit and I really feel like I can thrive here. But it's only been after, like, I know it shouldn't be external validation, but sometimes that external validation really does help. It helps with your own self. And then you kind of, once you have a little bit of that, you can kind of establish and be like, no, I'm a boss ass bitch. <laughs> like, <laughs> you need me, you need me on your team. Um, but it's, it, honestly, I feel like it comes with time. Yeah, and successes and failures as um, to what Michelle was saying. Did you have anything? That was great. Thank you so much, ladies. Thanks, ladies. You're all boss ass bitches. Oh, is that what she said? Oh, so that's, you know, um, I want to thank you all too. Um, and if you want to follow these ladies, I think they would be grateful for, for the follows on Twitter, Instagram. Anything else to plug? No? Uh, uh. I have something to plug. 
<laughs> um, I have an online community for um, career advancement for black and brown uh, or majority just like underrepresented people. Um, it's a really like a very like safe space. Um, and we do workshop um, online workshops. We do um, everything and like uh, the name is called Tech Stacked. And I'm offering for everybody here. Tech, it's like Tech Stack with an apostrophe D. Um, and for everybody here, I'm offering um, membership for $4 off per month forever. So it's um, offer code BUILD. Um, yeah, but if you go on my Twitter or whatever, you can find it. But we are doing um, career series, and um, we also did a pilot with Google where you have to get to bypass the application process. And it's not a black box. You actually, every step of the way, are getting feedback from applying, and you go straight to a recruiter. And we got 47% of people who um, applied through us got uh, first-round interviews. That's I dope. also have a plug. OK. <laughs> Let's get all the plugs in. I am looking for co-founders. Um, so if you're a technologist, um, even if you're a business person, um, I'm, I'm creating my first startup. And um, if you're in the insurance space, um, want to talk to you. But basically, the idea um, is uh, whether it's in like auto repairs or um, going to a healthcare practitioner, just creating more transparency in terms of like, well, how do I know the price you're quoting me for this like fender repair is actually like fair? Um, how do I know you're going to do a good job? Uh, similarly, you know, when I go to the doctor, um, you know, I don't want to like have you operate on me first before I realize like, hey, like my insurance doesn't fully cover this or um, like I should know the price upfront for whatever procedure um, and I should understand like, you know, the quality of the doctor in terms of like, do I like your bedside manner? So um, if you're in insurance, um, I'd like to pick your mind as like a potential customer. Um, if you have like NLP skills, just anyone really, just talk to me if you're interested. <laughs> That, that sounds good. That could be the next um, multi-billion dollar deal unicorn. Okay. Well, thank you, ladies, again. Thank you, guys, too. Thanks, ladies. All right, boss-ass bitch. Yes. <laughs> I think that's about to be the quote for the day. Actually, you know what? In unison. So... Uh, on the count of one to three, from the depths of your soul, yes. as loud as the ancestors can hear, I want to hear who's a badass bitch, all right? Woo! Or boss ass bitch, yeah. correction. One, two, three. Woo! I'm a boss ass bitch. Yeah. All right, Woo! great. All right, clap it up. <laughs> Thank you for that, Bria. Let's all get it on a shirt for next year.